Hi there. Um, in the interest of lunch coming up, I'm going to try and speed through and talk quickly. But if my Yankee accent gets too wonky when I talk fast, somebody just raise your hand and tell me to slow down. Um, I'm really grateful to have followed all these great presentations so far, which have gone over some concepts. So we'll sort of try and keep that moving as well and not get too into details. And uh, particularly following after Himmel saying timber negative returns in his study area, um, it's a, a good time to follow, I think. I'm going to talk to you today about natural capital and forestry investment. Um, first of all, we have an AFSL. I'm not selling you any investments, and this is not financial product advice. All right, so who is New Forest? <laughs> um, you have to do that. Um, New Forest, we're a funds management company based here in Sydney and operating with offices in Singapore and San Francisco, being where I'm originally from. Uh, we currently manage just over $1.25 billion in assets under management, and that's primarily for institutional investment clients endowments, pension funds, supers, insurance and reinsurance groups investing in the Timberland environmental markets um, asset classes. We're just under 30 people, like I said, based up in Chatswood in Sydney. Um, and across the globe, we have about 400,000 hectares of land under management. Um, about three quarters of that just under is here in Australia with about 100,000 hectares of softwood pine plantations and about 275,000 hectares of plantation land and trees that are from the managed investment scheme sort of fallout and rationalization process so that's blue gum. Um, and we like to think we're differentiated by our forward-looking investment strategies and that's what I'm really going to get talking to you about today. We have three different investment strategies. Um, the core of our business is focused here in Australia and New Zealand area and that is sustainable timber plantations. Uh, bottom left, tropical Asia forestry is focused on tropical timber plantations. Um, hardwood specifically, targeting the uh, high-growth Asian economies with growing timber demand. We also do a, a focus strategy based out of our U.S. office on ecosystem markets, um, environmental markets that are regulated in the U.S. And no, there aren't orangutans in the wild in the U.S., but we do, as I'll talk to you about in a minute, have a project where our U.S. fund has invested internationally in biodiversity markets. Uh, so first, I sort of wanted to kick off with our worldview on responsible investment in forestry. Um, the forest sector has undergone a great evolution over time from natural forest exploitation with very little regulation and use of ecosystem services purely as externalities to where we like to see it going today, which is the, the outer green band, where we see a future for intensively managed plantations put in the right spots, which will increasingly be in tropical and subtropical areas just because of the high productivity of growth in those regions. Um, we see it moving to... Can't hear. Should I use this? Yep. It's on? Is that any better? Oh, it's on quieter. It's just closer. It's better? OK. Um, so increasingly, a landscape and ecosystem-based management scale. Um, Josh discussed the number of uh, round tables and certification. It says on with the green light. Yeah, you might just have to talk into it. <laughs> All right. Um, so Josh already mentioned today the growing number of sustainability and certification schemes that are popping up. Um, the most obvious of those for us is the Forest Stewardship Council. However, we also have engagements with other um, programs such as RTRS, Roundtable on Responsible um, Soy, as well as RSPO, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. So we see growing demand for those being increasingly a driver for our investment programs. And ideally, what we're all here talking about today, ecosystems priced into environmental markets um, and valuing natural capital within business. Uh, so moving on from this, this is sort of our worldview, which applies to all three of our investment strategies. And I'm going to quickly give one example approaching landscape or ecosystem scales in each of our programs. So the first one, starting home here in Australia, on the left side is just a nice little graphic that shows how we really believe it is possible, and this follows great on the Kilter presentation, to really combine conservation production and ecosystem values in one landscape. Um, if you could see that picture a little bit better, you'd see there's some sheep and cows, and there's different types of cropping. There's trees, there's windbreaks, um, and what that's providing is not just timber, but other fibers, energy products, um, food, of course, but you also get things like dry land salinity benefits in Australia. You get carbon sequestration, and those are things that we're seeing increasingly have value and take on value in Australia. This map here shows New Forest Estate, which is the yellow color sprinkled about in our key forestry regions. The rest of the color blocks in there represent different types of reserves, national parks, indigenous reserves, heritage areas. Um, and I like this picture because it really shows in certain places how you get sort of an intersection of protected areas next to production for timber. Um, 
One example of where we're trying to take advantage of this is the, the Green Triangle. We've partnered with the Catchment Management Authority there um, and received a biodiversity fund grant from the government's first round of biodiversity fund um, earlier this year. And it's working to create biodiversity links that are going across private lands in key areas. And that's also a program that's involving some of the um, indigenous lands in the area. And it's organized by the CMA, but we'll see things like biodiversity carbon plantings in the uh, remnant vegetation areas on our properties. So we're really excited about programs like that. The government has put aside, as most of you probably know, $1.7 billion for the land care package. Um, so we'd really like to see programs like that, which are bringing private land and leveraging private investment to get outcomes on a diversity of land types. In the US, um, some of you are probably pretty familiar with the regulatory US env environmental markets in the US. On the right side is the most obvious, which is California's cap and trade scheme, which I've witnessed the policy up and downs firsthand for, for several years now. We're really excited to have a fund there, which is working specifically with sort of small to medium sized forest owners to do cessation of harvest on private lands. And these are non industrial um, timber lands. They're things like family forests that have been in the family for 100, 150 years. Um, there's also two Native American tribes we're working with who've entered their land into the program. And they'll be generating compliance carbon offsets for the California Compliance Scheme, which has launched in 2012 with the first compliance handover in 2013. Um, and on the left side is something you might be a little bit less familiar with, but it's called mitigation banking, which has three different types of banks being wetland streams and species banking. And I think Stuart's presentation introduced the, the mitigation hierarchy really well, so I'm going to kind of skip over that, but just mention really quickly the sort of scale that we're starting to see in that market in the US. Um, annually, there's about two to $3.4 billion in mitigation in the US. It's a significant size. Um, our joint venture fund, which is called the Eco Products Fund, has invested in the Piney Woods Mitigation Bank in Texas. It's the second largest wetlands bank in the US. It's about 19,000 acres, which is a pretty big chunk of land. Um, and it's providing mitigation to key industries in the area, including oil and gas, um, transportation developments for highways, and also water reservoir development that's going on in the area. Um, so that's just a, a sampling of what we're doing in the US, but I just really did want to highlight that these are significant markets. The carbon market projected to reach three to eight billion in offsets by 2020, and the mitigation market, um, our most well-established mature environmental market in the US. Finally, touching on Asia, which is where we really see a lot of our growth in the timber industry these days, um, our, our core business in Asia is tropical timber hardwood plantations, but this is the sort of coolest project, so I wanted to introduce it. It's called the Malawa Biobank. It was kicked off in 2008 with investment from that US fund, the Eco Products Fund, and it's protecting 34,000 hectares of the Ulusagama Forest Reserve in Malawa, which is in the state of Sabah in Malaysia. So Malaysian Borneo is what we're talking about. It's home to about 500 orangutans, which last I checked is about 20% of the subspecies of that particular orangutan. So it's, a, it's an important chunk when you start talking about quantifying the uh, abundance of biodiversity and genes and things like that. Um, the project was designed as a conservation finance investment. So it's a bit different from your sort of more typical protect an acre style nonprofit approach. It's meant to generate a return for the initial impact investors, and it's doing that through valuing biodiversity. There's a couple of key areas where we're trying to unlock that demand for biodiversity. One is with the Roundtable on uh, Sustainable Palm Oil. RSPO, as noted in Josh's market, is in the sort of mature certification scheme area now, although demand is still pretty low for its certified product. Um, but we're working with RSPO to help develop mechanisms for compensation for past high conservation value, or HCV, uh, forest loss areas. And similarly, there's a proposal in front of the FSC, which is uh, gaining some traction to do compensation for past forest clearance. So those are both efforts that would help bring more people into certification schemes, and by people, I mean companies that are producing those products by helping find a way to let them in the door and incentivize future good action um, and to somewhat atone for, for past uh, industry business as usual. So that's a really exciting project and we see further investment potential there, particularly there's a carbon methodology that you can do by helping to restore the forest. The Malawa forest had been previously logged. The government of Saba said, we want a way to keep this forest standing. If you know anything about the way palm oil typically works in Indonesia and Malaysia, companies will come in, extract high-value timber out of a natural forest. Once that high-value timber is gone, they say, oh, the forest has no value. We may as well knock it down 
and plant a palm oil plantation. Um, that's really unfortunate because there are still, as I say, 500 orangutans, signs of Sumatran rhino, which is extremely endangered in that forest. So New Forest came in and brought this mitigation banking model from our US experience into Malaysia. It's the first voluntary biobank in the, in the developing world that we're aware of. So it's a really cool project. If you want to hear more about that, it's mellowbiobank.com. It's a good amount of information. So last slide, going towards the future. As an investment company, I showed you our framework of sort of where we see the evolution of the forest sector going. Um, we really believe institutional and private capital is necessary to help make that transition. Um, there are productions, projections that global roundwood demand is going to plateau around 2030 at around 2 billion cubic meters of wood. It's actually possible from our calculations to produce that from around 3% of the world's forest cover area. That's just 100 to 150 million hectares of commercial plantation. Might sound like a lot, but in terms of the world's forest, it's actually a very small percentage. So what we see is the end game is getting the right kind of, of forest for timber production, being sustainable certified plantation timber producing areas in the right regions where you have high productivity, where technology can make a difference, where you can practice good civil culture, and then also taking advantage of um, the ability to price ecosystem services through things like RED, which hopefully everyone's familiar with RED, but reducing emissions from, develop, uh, from deforestation and degradation. Uh, from biobanking schemes, from watershed production, and to put that alongside production. So we see it as a stabilization of the natural forest area that is protecting these ecosystem services alongside productive areas that are also producing ecosystem services, including, not least of all, timber products and fiber. Uh, so ultimately, as I said, we see this as an important area for investment to bring that picture to scale. Um, there's a lot of challenges that have been noted, but you know, it's something that we're seeing actually start to, to take hold and happy to talk to you about it more later.